Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course European History. So last time we were focusing on queens and kings and rivalries. Today we're going to take a break from struggles over religion and political disputes that made for so much violence and look instead at some basics of everyday life. The food people ate centuries ago, the kinds of things they bought and sold, and changes in the kinds of lives people could hope to live. I know developments in agriculture and commerce may seem like sidelines to the main political show. I mean, there's a reason it's called Game of Thrones and not, like, Game of Slightly Improved Seed Quality, but I'd argue that history is about how people lived and what we might learn from their lives. And if you think about our lives today, our leaders are important, our forms of government are important, but as Miroslav Volf said, politics touches everything, but politics isn't everything. On a day-to-day -day basis, our lives are also shaped by the kinds of goods and services available to us and our professional and personal opportunities. Whether you go to school, whether you get enough to eat, the kinds of freedom you do and do not enjoy, those are the big questions we're exploring today. <laughs> The citizens of many European nations today have long life expectancies and a top standard of living. Europe also comprises the largest developed economic marketplace and a major region of trade. But in 1500, that was hardly the case. In the early 14th century, a major famine erupted with further famines across the centuries. We've talked about the Black Death. Trade was local and regulated by guilds, that is, by organizations of individual artisans and traders that determined the number and type of goods that could be produced and marketed. In the late Middle Ages, Europe was a subsistence economy with little, if any, agricultural surplus. If princes could satisfy their their appetite for food and drink on a regular and reliable basis, they were virtually alone in experiencing a consistently full stomach. In 1500, Europe was not exceptional in life expectancy or in many other measures of well-being. But in the early modern period, roughly between 1500 and 1750, the situation gradually improved. And I know that seems impossible given all the religious strife and wars and massacres we've discussed so far in this series, but during this period, population actually rose. In Britain, for instance, the population almost doubled between 1700 and 1800. Historians attribute this rise to developments in agriculture, sometimes called an agricultural revolution that unfolded alongside all that warfare. And there was also growth in commerce, often called a commercial revolution. And of course, the Columbian Exchange, which made new nutritious foods from potatoes to corn available to Europeans. But the agricultural revolution was also driven by innovation that dramatically boosted agricultural yield in Europe between 1500 and 1800. Let's go to the thought bubble. For starters, it was discovered that planting certain crops like turnip and clover could replenish soil, which was one example of crop rotation. Farmers would plant one crop in a field one year and then another the next year, rotating two or at times three crops to add nutrients to the soil. And the great thing about crop rotation is that it decreased the amount of farmland that needed to remain fallow each year, that is, unplanted. Secondly, with the Dutch pioneering some advances, land reclamation occurred across Europe. This entailed converting marshes and other previously unusable land into farmland. And third, common lands were enclosed. Enclosure occurred when wealthier farmers bought up or simply took common land, land that had been open to community use. Private farms were able to innovate faster than communities, which required consensus in group decision making. And fourth, there were new inventions, such as the seed drill and a plow that could be drawn by two instead of six or eight farm animals. The new plow cut down on expenses, and the seed drill made planting more accurate with less wasted seed. Both of these new tools, by the way, copied Chinese inventions. But while enclosure and more mechanized farming practices did mean more overall food and therefore more overall wealth, not everyone benefited, because a decrease in common land meant that fewer people had direct access to land for their own use. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So one example of all these innovations can be seen in the life of Elizabeth, Countess of Sutherland, who inherited some 800,000 acres of land in Scotland.
Scotland. Stan, hold on a second. Is that a trout in her hair? Is it a feather? Was there some kind of hair fish trend at the time? Let's move on from lighthearted portrait jokes and talk about people being wrested from their land. So Elizabeth removed hundreds of tenants from her estate, then created unified acreage for farming and raising sheep with the help of day laborers. These landless workers were cheaper, and also unlike the tenant farmers who had lived on the land previously, day laborers did not have long-standing claims to inhabit and work the land, called tenancy. The Countess was known for chasing villagers away from their land with her own hands, and also for innovations that increased productivity even as Sutherland's former tenants became homeless. So more overall food, but on land controlled by fewer people. So obviously this agricultural revolution entailed massive social dislocation that included the rise of poverty, migration of disenfranchised farm workers to cities, and also to other continents. And even as overall agricultural production rose, some among the poor starved. And this period of European history is still widely debated, in part because ideas of private property and inequality of wealth remain resonant today. But whether this modernization helped or hurt humanity again depends on your perspective. To some, it was fatal. To many, it meant trauma and impoverishment as people were removed from lands their families had farmed for generations. But these changes also helped fuel greater overall food production, population growth, larger cities, and more space for all kinds of specialized labor, from shoemaking to theater. I mean, it's no coincidence that Shakespeare and Marlowe were writing as English agricultural production started to increase. Farmers started experimenting with all kinds of new crops, but especially with maize and potatoes, which could produce super abundant. Did the world just open? Is there a potato in the center of the world? There's a lot of candidates for most important plant of the last 500 years, but I'm gonna say it's the potato. They contain lots of carbohydrates and whatever micronutrients are. You can turn them into both french fries and tater tots, the world's two most important foods. But most importantly, you don't need great soil to have great potatoes. Just ask Idaho. In addition to the transfer of crops, knowledge of agriculture was transferred from Africa and the Americas to Europe. Women in both the Americas and Africa had made their regions food rich, as European traders and invaders testified, and their knowledge of crops and irrigation techniques allowed, for instance, rice to be grown in larger quantities in European colonies. Much of what Europeans learned about agriculture from Africans came from enslaved women agriculturalists. Slavery has existed for millennia, but slaves have experienced very different lives depending on culture and religion and occupation and gender. Before 1650, the Atlantic slave ships took an annual total of around 7,500 Africans to the Western Hemisphere. And that number was comparable to other slave routes, such as the one in South Asia or the Ottoman Empire. The vast majority of those slaves went to Mexico and South America. European ships transported other slaves from the Indian Ocean across the Pacific, many of them to Mexico. But beginning in the late 17th century, there was a massive upsurge in African slavery that sought to replace the labor of the Native American populations that had been utterly devastated by disease and warfare. In particular, slave labor was used to fill the world's increasing demand for commodities and consumer goods. Europeans came to depend on sugar and tobacco and coffee and tea, many of which were produced primarily via forced labor. And racism developed alongside the growth of the African slave trade. At first, Europeans were in awe of African wealth in the 15th and 16th centuries. In fact, it motivated their first contacts. They craved African gold and found African men and women stately and intelligent and rich, as one Portuguese trader wrote. However, greed for profit took over, and as the indigenous population in the Americas declined, the desire for slaves grew. And to justify slavery, European descriptions of Africans became contemptuous and dehumanizing. As dehumanization progressed, Europeans treated Africans as morally and intellectually inferior and used those incorrect constructions to justify their horrendous treatment of Africans, packing them into slave ships and subjecting them to the lethal middle passage across the Atlantic. African kings and independent African traders fed the rising demand for slaves. In those days of state consolidation, African rulers sought funds for weaponry, which Europeans provided in exchange for 
slaves. More advanced weaponry then allowed leaders to capture additional people to sell to European slavers for yet more weapons. European slavers mostly operated along the West African coast, while Arabs took slaves from East Africa to sell to India or into the Middle Eastern markets. The Saharan slave trade went northward, transporting many women slaves to serve as domestics and as sex workers. But the European slave market was by far the largest and the most violent, and its legacy of dehumanizing racism continues to this day. In the 18th century, one million slaves worked in the sugar industry and diamond and gold mines of Brazil. These industries were tremendously lucrative, and in that sense, slavery both produced and was a product of growing European wealth. The conditions of slavery were truly dire. Torture, beatings, overwork, and malnutrition were routine. And because the system itself did not treat them as humans, enslaved people had very little recourse. And there was always the knowledge that you could be separated from your children, from your family at any time, because you were treated legally and practically as property. The slave trade itself was part of a web of interactions that is still being understood. Historians used to talk about the triangle trade, ship took small iron goods from Britain to Africa, trading them for slaves, and then shippers dropped off the slaves who survived the passage in Brazil or the Caribbean and then filled their holds with local sugar or molasses to take back to England. But while there was a triangle, there were also many other shapes. West African rulers and consumers wanted cowrie shells and Indian textiles as payment for slaves. These products took a much more circuitous route than a simple triangle. Cowrie shells, for example, were picked up from merchants along the Pacific Ocean or South Asian coasts, then cured and processed in Sri Lanka, then shipped again, with slaves coming to the New World across the Pacific and commodities to pay for them flowing in multiple directions, the slave trade into the Americas was part of a global, not just triangular, market. In fact, multidirectional trade in general was increasing in diversity and quantity. In the 17th century, for instance, literally millions of pieces of porcelain went in Portuguese ships to Dutch and other European ports, and to get funds to buy that porcelain, European shippers did a lot of local coastline shipping, stopping at ports around the Indian Ocean or at Chinese depots in the Philippines. European consumers snapped up goods and merchants grew wealthy. The increase in consumption was truly unprecedented. For example, in 1660, the East India Company imported 23 pounds of tea to Britain. In 1750, it imported 5 million million pounds. Remember Queen Isabella's daughter getting a tiny box of sugar for a Christmas gift? Well, soon sugar was available to many Europeans. Innovation was also an important facilitator of economic growth. And I don't just mean innovation in terms of actual things. I also mean innovation in terms of ideas, like corporations. The East India companies, such as those founded in Britain, the Netherlands, and France, focused each kingdom's international trade and raised funds for investment. Joint stock companies arose to finance merchant ships, and the development of double-entry bookkeeping gave merchants and bankers a better idea of inflows and expenditures. However, there wouldn't be laws limiting the liability of such companies until much later, so a ship lost at sea could still mean investors' loss of homes and possessions. Whereas now, when investors do things that lose money, we just give them their money back. And talking of bankers brings us to the Fuggers, the Fugger family of bankers who once loaned money to monarchs such as Charles V and Philip II of Spain, who then spent everything on defeating Protestants, and when the monarchy went bankrupt, the bankers were penniless too. This whirl of commerce disrupted society because it produced new values, and also because it created new groups of wealthy, influential people. Almost everywhere in Europe, people who weren't aristocrats became rich from global expansion of trade. Many of the aristocrats also became richer, of course, but the wealth of new groups of people upset long-held notions about the importance of family lineage, and capitalism, that is, the private ownership of enterprises, changed everyday values and turned activities toward making profit above all else. Capitalism also created a new class of wealthy traders and merchants who competed for political influence with those from hereditary status groups, such as the nobility. We'll hear much more, of course, about the twists and turns of capitalism and aristocracy across the centuries, but by the beginning of the 18th century, capitalism was in a lively state 
stage of development thanks to the abundance provided by the agricultural and commercial revolutions and also by the Atlantic slave trade, which wrenched some 11 to 12 million Africans from their homes and families. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching Crash Course European History, which was filmed here in Indianapolis and made with the help of all of these nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe, and Crash Course exists because of your generous support at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Thanks again for watching, and as they say in my hometown, don't forget to be awesome.